Beautiful. You got to get all of us. If, you, if Rachel's going in, you got to get all of us. do this on camera? <laughs> it's already Are rolling. rolling? <laughs> well, hell yeah. <laughs> Good like, morning, like, New like, Jersey. <laughs> like Buffett says, it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's good. That's good. Whoa. That's good. That's good. <laughs> well, what the hell? I'm 71 going on 75 with this shot right now. Oh, man. Corrected coffee. Here we Here go. Here we go, man. Cheers, Rachel. Yeah, man. Thank you so much Fuck for coming yeah. on. Yeah, man. Oh, it was my pleasure. Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks for coming oh, on. Okay, good I'll, enough. I'll hurt my back if I go any further. <laughs> I did hurt your back. Well, I was oh, God. drinking I get coffee hurt. and... <laughs> 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 I could get hurt. The That's always how it eyes. happens, man. Especially like you're an athlete, right? So you have an injury and somebody's like, how'd you do that, man? Were you like, you know skiing off a cliff or something you're like no i rolled over in bed and uh <laughs> i tripped walking fucking, in my truck yeah, i sneezed <laughs> he tripped and, uh, he, he tripped over a paver walking for his rotator <laughs> the, cuff was out for like six months no. No, at the palm beach boat show i'm walking in my truck after the presentation my boot caught the the edge of a of a loose of a of a raised paver yeah i did his face plant with a heavy bag on my oh. shoulder I tore my rotator cuff oh. and, and pulled my bicep tendon off my shoulder. Of your fishing arm? Well, you probably are both, but your right, your dominant it's my, arm, it's my everything arm. Oh fuck! And did you it have was, any shoulder issues before that? Uh, yeah, but not like that. But not like that. That was probably no, I, the only joint in your body that you probably hadn't. Uh, <laughs> it, it had already hurt, but I, you know. But of the twenty-four operations I've had, yeah. that was probably the worst. Really? I, it, to do this? Yeah. It's like forever. You're you're going. How long did it take to get back? A year. Ooh. It completely my my golf swing was already on the on the down sli- downside, yep. but with that destroyed my I had a hundred hundred and some mile an hour swing before that, and I went right down to like seventy eight. You oh, know, man. all right. This podcast is about Rachel, not you getting <laughs> no, it's hurt all good. anymore. So. Enough about <laughs> me. What do you think about me? <laughs> <laughs> but remember. What's your, what's what's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine. That's right, man. We're... Rachel, thank you so much for uh, for coming on oh, the podcast. Um, my pleasure. I saw the the the, the film. I, I looked up a, a bunch of stuff about you, about your fishing career, your guiding, where you've been. You've got such a rich life, uh, no question, in fishing. But I think your life as a person far exceeds your life as a fisherman you know and one of the things i was thinking about this recently we were talking about somebody who said who are you how do you answer that question because a lot of times you think well i'm a fisherman i've done this i've done that these are things we do mm-hmm. but when you think a little bit deeper who are you it doesn't include the things we, we do right who are you Well, I think first and foremost, I'm an artist. That's really, as much as I try to not be an artist so because I'm lazy, but I think that my inherent being is as a creative person. And I don't have the typical fishing background that most of you guys have, like my family, my dad taught me to fish. I I don't come from that kind of a background. But as far back as I can remember, I was always drawing or you know, uh, looking at life in that kind of a, a creative uh, oeuvre, 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 French word, whatever, way. So I would say that's my, like, down to the core description of me would be, and that mean, meaning like an artist, like I'm always making art, but I, I, I'm an observer, you're also you're not conventional in any way. No, <laughs> I was going to say start, start, you know starting well, out even from the way I look and my name and your laugh. What a beautiful laugh! Oh, thank you. When I called you the other you know, day, you, I said, you "Rachel, fuck me up, man." You're like, "When do you remember the first time you laughed?" And I'm like, "Dude, that's deep." Like, no, I don't. Like, I, but, I've been thinking about it since then. I'm like, yeah. But your laugh is very different. It's very boisterous. It's full, full of life. Well, it's 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 <laughs> it's got big power. Thank you. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad. Sometimes it's not so good. But uh, what do you mean it's not so good? No, I mean, you know, I am what I am, right? I mean, I can't. I have. Yeah, I mean, I'm loud. Well, so I am 
loud and boisterous, but I'm actually very um, much the opposite too in a lot of ways. I'm Are you very, kind of shy? I, I, you know, way? as a kid, I was painfully shy, which is surprising, right? Uh, now to most people that meet me, I was like the kind of kid that like hung on my dad's leg, you know, and mm. was really shy. And I don't know when I started to become more gregarious or whatever, but I am pretty uh, shy and quite sensitive, actually. <laughs> when you when you were growing up, were your friends creative in in art in that way? Or Not did you... so much. I was a uh, I grew up in suburban Boston, okay, Newton, Massachusetts, and um, I was a tomboy. I was an athlete, you know. And I know it's hard to believe now, but what was um, your sport? Played everything. But remember this, I'm 61 years old. So being a girl back then, it wasn't a lot of, you know, uh, women's sports mm. opportunities. So whatever. I played with the boys. Most of my friends were boys. And I was pretty good, man. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, so we played whatever. We played baseball. We played street hockey. You know, big Boston thing. Um, wow. And uh, <clears throat> then um, my family, my dad is a shoe designer, women's shoes. So uh, when I was 10 years old, he moved our family to Florence, Italy to work there. Interesting. Yeah, it was cool. Amazing. Life-changing. And I started playing soccer, you know. And I went to this amazing little American school there that was full of expats and people. And I started playing soccer. And it was only a boys' team. So I played on the boys' team. I was actually captain of the boys' team. That's so, amazing. That's so, so from cool. the beginning, I was uh, always accepted by guys as for my ability. And I think that has uh, – been a benefit to me. I mean, it's just whatever. I, some women aren't, some women, whatever. It's not like I don't have a, there isn't, I don't know. It's just made things a lot There's easier. There's no barriers. No barriers. Yeah. And I never, nobody ever put barriers on me. So I, I think that was a really, and team sports, right? I mean, I was sure. a real team sports person. Mm -hmm. So that shaped my character. But yeah, there, I didn't have a lot of creative friends. And I had a very conventional, you know, um, Childhood like that, going to high school, playing all varsity level sports every season. Uh, I'm sort of ambidextrous in a weird way. So I am I throw right, I fish right. All right, throw left, fish right, tennis right, soccer left. I always wanted to play shortstop in softball and they wouldn't let me. So it's like, fuck that, man. So I started playing lacrosse and that was a great sport. And then I went to college. I did want to go study art in college. So to find like, I didn't want to go to art school though. Because I wanted to play sports, you know. No art schools have sports teams, like varsity level sports teams. So I ended up going to a small liberal liberal arts college in New York State called Skidmore College, and was able to pursue an art degree and play, you know, sports. So I played soccer, ice hockey. They had ice hockey, which was amazing. Very cool. Because there was no ice hockey for girls back then, and uh, they're like, "Hey, we're gonna have an ice hockey team. Do you want to play?" I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to play. I'm like, do you know how to skate? I'm like, not really, but I'll play goalie. I was a soccer goalie. How hard can it be, right? right. You know, so uh, it was amazing. You know, we were just this great group of women. There were actually a few women that had gone to like private schools where they did have hockey programs. But most of us were just like curious or had brothers that always played. I did not. I have a brother, but he wasn't a hockey player. So that was like a dream come true to be able to play hockey. And I was pretty good, actually. But, um, yeah, so uh, – and then a lacrosse. I played, you know, four years. I played varsity-level sports and then was doing art and then um, wanted to pursue art. So I – this was in Saratoga Springs, New York. I took a couple years off uh, after college and stayed in that town. That's where I met my husband, Jeff. He owned a bar in Saratoga. And uh, so I hung out there and then I decided I want to continue with art. So I applied to graduate schools and I got into Yale, which was like, who who wow. would have thought that would have happened and went to uh, <clears throat> get a master's of fine arts in Yale and was never fishing, wasn't even fishing back then. I was actually windsurfing when I got out of college. Right. So you had all that organized sports stuff going on and all team stuff. So when I got out of school, I'm like, now what do I do, man? Like, you, you lost your playground. Yeah. 
I lost all my playmates, you know? Was your, yeah. was your dream coming out of college to be an independent artist and sell your art for dealers or collectors or museums? What? I'm not quite sure what I thought. For a little while, in the beginning of college, I thought, okay, I'll pursue uh, like commercial art, graphic art. And then I took a painting class, and I'm like, oh, this is great. I really want to do this. But I was also very interested in theater. I'm a, a huge, like most guides, I'm a huge musical theater freak, you know? I mean, kidding. But uh, I was just, just <laughs> going to question that. Like, no, uh, I no. know. I'm a, that's it went so right over Okay, so I uh, also toyed with the idea. I worked, I uh, had a job in Albany uh, as a scenic artist. I thought, okay, I'll go be a scenic artist. But then I really liked uh, just painting so i guess yeah when you you start uh you know studying painting and especially in a program like yale you, you the drive is yes you're gonna go to new york city you're gonna slay it you're gonna be a fucking famous yeah. artist which is like brutal right mm -hmm. so i did follow that model and you lived in brooklyn right i did for a while um when i got out of uh, yale jeff was not a city guy he had just sold his bar and we made kind of a a deal like to move outside of the city, you know, to see have him pursue whatever he was into was bartending or whatever and I would go be able to go into the city and that didn't work. We actually broke up. We weren't married, but uh he went north. His uh dream. He grew up around the Saratoga area. He was a skier from the beginning. And uh his idea dream was to move up to Lake Placid and become uh, a ski patroller and, and live up there. So he went up there, and I did go to the city. And I lived all around. I never lived in Manhattan. Started off in Jersey City. Then a group of my friends from Yale, we had a tight group of friends. We, we got the lease of a floor of a building in Brooklyn, a 10,000-square-foot loft building. Wow. And it was uh, in Greenpoint. And at, back then, Greenpoint, which is an, uh, a neighborhood right on the river, okay, so closer to Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, it was a Polish neighborhood, but, right. you know, it was full of, like, crackheads and everything. It was an industrial building, and the, the six of us renovated this entire floor all by ourselves and made living spaces out mm. of it, which was all illegal, but it was amazing. It was fucking amazing. And I had a, a loft that was bigger than this room. It was 1,500 square feet. Wow. Had 15-foot ceilings. And we put all our own plumbing in, man. I was the uh, solderer. I was really good at sweating pipe back then. This was copper, no more, no, no pecs and everything. But uh, and had these amazing living spaces. And I, we, you know, back then I didn't have any skills, you know, <laughs> like marketable skills. But I ended up, uh, I worked uh, as an assistant to my uh, mentor, uh, a painter. His name was Jake Berto. He was an amazing guy, and I was kind of his assistant. So I would stretch his canvas. You know, this is like the uh, artists, uh, typical, you know, really like a dream to work for your hero. It would be like, you know, I work for Stu Apt. I like rig all, I do all this rigging, right. you know, I clean, slides, I clean yeah. his reels, you know, yeah. and you'd be like jazzed about cleaning his reel. You'd be like, oh, well, you know, so I did that for a while. And then I would visit Jeff, uh, up North, you know, and then finally I said, okay, I'm going to try living up there. And once I started living up there, I was like, dude, this is pretty nice. Is that when you discovered fishing, fly fishing? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, during this whole time and before that, after college, I got uh, into windsurfing big time. So I'm OK. I'm obsessive. Right. So whatever I get into, I get into. And it was funny because Jeff and his buddies, you know, these this was a party town, man. Saratoga was like bars closed at four in the morning. Sometimes he'd get home at like seven in the morning oh, and then they'd go hang out at this lake. And they had like a windsurfer one design, which was like the first one of the first windsurfers. And these guys invented stand up paddle boarding. OK, this is almost 40 years ago. They would just lay around on the board. They didn't put the sail on. They were paddle around, drinking, whatever, smoking pot, dogs, you know. And I'm like, what's that thing? And they're like, oh, there's this sail that goes on it. We don't do that part. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to check that out. So I started doing that. And that was like, Psh. so I would do that wherever I could and flash forward up you know, 10 years and I would go down to North Carolina, you know, probably drive right past Sarah and those guys, you know, on the Cape Hatteras and the, or lakes or wherever. Right. I did it in New Haven, you know, wherever you can do it, you do that sport. And that's a terrible sport to be into because once you get into it, oh, is that a dog? Uh, 
once you get into it and you want a lot of wind, you can't like predict when there's going to be a lot of wind. Yeah. So I was like just compulsive liar. It, it, it's just, you know, I have Tuesday off. I'm going to go windsurfing, but it's, but it's windy on Monday. You know, you're like, fuck, <laughs> oh, I'm, I can't come in today or whatever, whatever job I was bartending. I had all kinds of stuff. And then eventually I was up north in the Adirondacks visiting Jeff and I was windsurfing on this small lake by myself and I injured my back really bad. I was by myself. I was wearing a dry suit, the old O'Neill dry suit with a big, big ne- a neoprene suit with a zipper on the back, right? And I'm like lying on the ground there going, fuck, what am I going to do? I attached the zipper pull to the car and kind of got myself out, got myself home, and I was pretty messed up. And how did you, you – I mean, you obviously fell with, you know, windsurfing. I don't know what happened, man. I think the, a back injury like that is, you know – I think progressive years of bad posture. So it wasn't a bad fall on the windsurfing. No, or... no, it was just like we were just talking about before we started. Like, right. how'd you do it? I don't know. I like twisted and whatever. I was fucked up, but um, and I had injured my back before that, but it was pretty bad. And so it was a long rehab. And Jeff had grown up fly fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, was he fishing at the time? We were fishing together at the time, like when we got together, but all spin fishing. We'd go out. And classic Adirondack style, like troll, Lake Clear wobblers and worms for, for brook trout and stuff in, in the lakes or ponds, as we call them. And I'm like, all right, this is, you know, I mean, he was always rowing the boat or doing in control of it. And I was like, just sort of, you know, okay, whatever. You weren't intrigued with it. I wasn't like that intrigued with it especially because I didn't understand what was going on underneath right. the water. Mm-hmm. So when I was uh, messed up with the back injury, he's like, well, why don't you go fly fishing? You know, I'm living literally a mile and a half from the west branch of the Osable River. So I'm like, okay. So he gave me a uh, Leonard bamboo rod that belonged to his grandfather. His grandfather had won this rod in a poker game at a fishing lodge in New Hampshire years ago. His grandfather started him fly fishing. He's got the classic. He had the classic story of D- learning. Great DNA. Yeah. And so I was just, that was it, man. The minute I, I just fucking did that every day. I was out there every day. I had no idea what I was doing. And I, what really amazes me now living there for so long and having this beautiful river is I went to the same spot every day. I didn't catch a fish for, I don't even know how far, how long it was. And then there was this older man that would kind of show up at the same spot and we would kind of like compete, you know, he was very heavy set dude. And back then, you're not going to know what this is. You might remember what seal dry waders were. Do you remember? They were like latex Mm -hmm. and he would just put these waders on. He was, and he, this guy became my like best friend, right? (laughs) You know, and taught me so much. Uh, he was like my first kind of fly mentor, but Jeff would, we would go fly fishing. And that was it for me. And I loved immediately, even without catching fish, being in the water and all of like the just the visual, you know, so connected to what was going on. Well, I think I'm just I'm just um, guessing here. You're such an artist. I think the artistry of maybe throwing the fly and the loop and the rhythm and the tempo of, of casting a fly line. Oh, and, yeah. And the whole the whole pace of of fly fishing, mm-hmm. you know, the bug life, the rivers flowing, mm-hmm. the birds, the fly rod. Um, I, w- I was always enamored initially with being able to throw that line. Oh, yeah. It's almost like a, you know, it's like beautiful. a stroke on a, on a canvas. It's beautiful. Right? Oh, exactly. And there is that guy that makes the, um, have you seen that guy? I forget his name. He paints. It's kind of sticky. He, uh, I think I just made up a word. Uh, <laughs> I love he paints it up with his fly line? Well, shtick, you know, that's like, not stick. Shtick, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm Jewish, so yeah. that's like a Yiddish word, but shticky. Anyways, yeah, the dude puts like um, paint on the end of whatever. I don't know what he's got on the end of the line, whether it's like a little piece of material that he, or it's, I don't think it's a brush per se, or maybe he's made, I don't want to screw with this guy. He makes some cool paintings, and he just sort of casts at the uh, canvas and it with paint and kind of splatters it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, mm. whatever gets you off where, but, uh, where, look you, uh, you said uh, on the phone you call yourself an artist a hoarder and a guide right <laughs> i want to dive into the hoarding thing here okay if you don't mind 
<laughs> Come on, let's go to the we've, dark we've side. Covered, oh, we've, we've covered the artist. Yeah. Oh, she's a hoarder. I don't know, man. <laughs> Do you watch I, that on TV, The Hoarders? I have seen it. Yeah, I don't want to see it because I'll, <laughs> I'll, it'll just, I'll have to start you therapy ca- again are, are you, if I are, watch that. Are you like um, like tenfold hoarder? Are you oh, just, no. You no. just dabble with hoarding. You can walk into my house, but uh, <laughs> I don't is- know, man. I'm just like a... Well, why should I throw that away? You know, or like, you know, I just accumulate objects and things. And I'm always um, so Jeff passed away in 2019. uh, And now I live in the house that we both lived in by myself. And I just cannot believe that two people lived in that house that well, he didn't have as much stuff as I had, but whatever. There's just and most of it's fishing stuff, mm-hmm. you know. And, yeah, have you ever uh, been to Bob Popovich's house? No, but I bet it's pretty. Oh my god, it's just insane. Um, <laughs> we did a podcast with him the other day, and upstairs. Yeah. So, oh, I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, my yeah. god, it's crazy. So yeah. they used to have. He used to have like, you know, I think he said at one point maybe a hundred people in that house. I know. No, I know fifty. No, not not a hundred. But you 50, can't physically get a hundred. I there. know, but he had fifty. Yeah. Maybe. Anyway, it's a small little room. Yeah. And every Tuesday night from January to May, yeah. they would all go there and they would all tie flies oh, individually. Awesome. They would share information, talk uh-huh. about, about fishing. And the staircase going up is about that narrow into this little room. And he said guys would be on the staircase looking up between the legs of other guys in the room no. to, to, to gather and hear the information that was and taking place. And it's got place. like, yeah, it's this a, isn't, it's I remember seeing pictures. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. It's like the, the, uh, attic, yeah, right, or something. There was no yeah. room for a full podcast with three <laughs> and of us. He's so a big just, dude, right? Oh yeah, so. yeah he's big. <laughs> he's got he's got all the information from the early years of the saltwater uh, <gasps> fly rotters of America. Wow, the ground floor. It's of like an fly archive. Fishing. Yes, and there's boxes and flies, and you have no idea. But it's all invaluable stuff. I feel better. I wouldn't say that my uh, stuff is invaluable, but. I, it's, uh, it's it's invaluable to you, perhaps. Otherwise, you wouldn't. Maybe be I don't know. Do you it. really need that many waiting belts? You know, I mean. Oh, like, really? That kind of stuff. Well, like stuff you've accumulated, like or never thrown away. Yeah. You know, like I could open a, a size nine shoe store. You know, uh, oh, really? for waiting shoes. You know, I I got I gave them all away, but at one point I think in my basement I had I don't know. Like fucking like twenty five thirty pairs of waiting shoes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but all the same size, right? I mean, they, like they, the size nine school of fly fishing, you know. Or were they made by Prada <laughs> with cleats on the bottom? No, dude, Patagonia, man. Yeah, tell me about your hat real quickly. Okay, so this is an Argentine hat called a boina, and it's a gaucho hat. Mm-hmm. And I spend some time in Argentina, and I love hats. I'm a hat person. Um, but once I I knew the minute I saw this kind of hat that I had to have one, and I love it because it's just um, as we were talking about yesterday, it's so expressive. You can kind of you know rock it yeah, any way yeah. you want well, it. You, well, you gave me one. I, uh, yeah, I, well, I, you, let's man, see I, it. I rock it, man. One. I know you got to do the hearty thing, but <laughs> you have the so best visor no, hair, though. The, the, oh, it's well. not gonna. You're not gonna. Well, thank God, a seventy-one. I even have here. There you go. I mean, look at Popovich. He's seventy-five, and he's looks like a bald egg. There you go. That's good. That's good. You're rocking it like a backwards hat, though. You want it That's out okay. in front of forward? That's okay. okay. You can rock it any just, way you I want. I used to wear berets backwards. Yeah. Get closer to the mic. But you can, you can rock it any way you want. That's the way, you know, however you're feeling. But it's also, I wear it guiding um, because it actually covers my ears from mm. sun, you know, better than a baseball hat. Are you into fly tying? Yes. Because I feel like that'd be a natural progression for you. Yes. I'm not a very good fly tire, but um, I love it. I love doing it. I, You know what? I love doing it for flies that I'm going to use, right. but I'm a guide. So I have to, you know, crank out like, you know, okay, I'm going to tie like 150 girdle bugs. Like what's fun about that? Nothing to me, at least like production tying, you right. know, it's like assembly line and guide flies, you know, yeah. nothing too serious, but I like to steal head fish. I like to swing flies. So I love to tie like that. You know, when you're tying for yourself, you'll like tie like one or two, you know, of what you're doing. And then that's fun. You know, when you have to tie like 50, you know, a sable wolf. So you're like, Oh fuck, you know, and then you have to figure out how to, well, what was the, um, 
Who's the guy that wrote the book on production fly tying? But anyways, so you know, so spend a whole day like putting beads on hooks. You know, spend right, the, the right, next, right. you know, Do you, one sure, step I don't know first. if you guys have ever tied like that. Hopefully you don't have to because no. it kind of sucks. I hate tying trout flies. Really? Oh my god. Yeah, tarpon flies are one you, thing. You know, yeah. They're so big. And they're so small. It's like I can't see. Oh, it's brutal, yeah. Like, you know, I got buddies who, you know, the chocolate, you know, they tie <laughs> these 28, you know. Oh, yeah, that's major. brutal. That's brutal. But uh, But as a guy like Nikki too, you know, you go through so many, you don't want to be buying flies. Right. Especially if they're pretty easy to tie. Right. I'm kind of interested in how you made the transition from a fly fisherman to a fly fishing guide. Okay. Because I'll, that's yeah. a big step. It was it, a big it, step. It could yeah. be sometimes kind of ugly if you have to make money and there are a lot of people say, well, I know how to fish. I'm yeah. going to become a guide. And then it gets ugly because you're kind of babysitting initially sometimes. Like Nikki says, sometimes these people show up and and they don't want to listen to you. Right. You're kind of babysitting, yeah. you know, all this. Yeah, I don't call myself a guide. I well, take people fly fishing. Okay, well. Well, if you guide good, how many man. days of summer? That's it's, it's just you, you can know call when yourself I think, a guide. I mean, honestly, when I think of guides, I think of like, you know, Stu App, Steve Huff, Doug Kilpat, like the best, like that that live and breathe guiding. And yeah. I'm just a, a part time guide, yeah. right? person that yeah. takes people fishing. Yeah, and so I feel like that diminishes the word guide. And oh, I'm, I don't know. Don't be I, so hard on yourself. Uh, I mean, being a guide. Well, for me, how it happened was so I was up in Lake Placid. For the summer, I would spend uh, the whole summer up there. I would before that, I would commute back and forth from Brooklyn to Lake Placid, and then I was up there for the summer, and I needed a job. And here I am with a fancy, you know, degree from Yale. I have absolutely no skills. Like I don't know how to use a computer. Well, computers were just starting, not just starting, but using computers in business. Whatever. I have like nothing, like marketable, <laughs> you know. On paper. So uh, I was driving along the river and there's a place called the Hungry Trout and they had just opened uh, a fly shop. And I saw in the paper, you know, they had an ad for somebody. I'm like, dude, I'm going to go work in a fly shop, you know. So I interviewed with uh, the owner was Jerry Botcher and and, you know, I, ha- I was good with people. I knew that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, let me work in this shop. And I really I had no clue about a lot of things and technical or anything or flies. And, and I just learned from there. And actually (laughs) how I learned about flies was I was stocking. I had one of those Plano boxes with like 24, you know, little rows. And I, and I dropped it on the floor of the fly shop and it was like all fucking caddis. Right. (laughs) And I had to like put them back, you know, and I'm like, what the fuck dude? Like, I don't even know what these things are, you know, and wow, they're all different sizes, you know, and I was just like, okay, that was like the beginning. And then over time in the shop, we had one guide and, uh, and I was like, and he was kind of a rough dude. He was from Western New York, from the Great Lakes Steelhead uh, River, the Salmon River in, in Western New York. And he was a good angler, but he was kind of rough around the edges, dude, you know, and um, we had a lot of clients like from the city and, you know, and, and I would just watch him interact with people, and I'm like, wow, man, I can totally do that way better than him, you know. So the next year, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to get my guide's license. And, and because it, to me, immediately, it seemed, yes, guiding is about fishing, but guiding is about people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's an entertainment yeah. business. It really Well, is. it's an entertainment business, but it's really, it, it's a service, okay? Mm-hmm. So it's... I think the more, you know, I've been doing it th- over 30 years. So really the one thing that I, I think at least the more that I do it, it's almost like the less it is about the fishing. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's more about trying for me, at least trying to sort of get inside this person's head and figure out what they want without really asking them, mm-hmm. you know, like, cause everybody wants something different, right? You got the guy that, well, here's a great example. I had these two uh, brother-in-laws, right, Frank and Bob. They're actually from New Jersey, and uh, they couldn't have been more opposite, right? And they'd show up, and I'd say, uh, Frank, you know, what do you want to do today? And he's like, oh, I just got this two-weight Winston, you know, I want to just throw a little dry fly and maybe catch a little brook trout, you know, and 
I'm like, okay, cool. And Bob, what do you want to do today? Well, I want to catch big fish. <laughs> and a lot of them. <laughs> that, that, that's every one of my clients. Right. And so, <laughs> so, all right, let's just get it. I'm an asshole. So I would say to Bob, I said, Bob, well, Bob, I want world peace. Let's just, <laughs> you know, somewhere in between these two ideas, we can maybe meet. And Bob would always win out because he was very aggressive. And actually, at one point, I guess Bob was like a competitive bass guy. So he was an animal. And he was also one of the – he was a very good angler. He was so fucking lucky, man. Like, because it would get to the point where I I would go out of my way and I would put Bob, yeah, Bob, go down there, man. Yeah, just go check that out down there. And I didn't know if it was any good or whatever. Frank, you come up here with me. And, you know, it was all walkwayed. I do all walkwayed. So on a pocket water river. So it was brutal. You know, you're – back and forth in the rocks. And Bob would always come up with a fucking big fish, man. I mean, he was amazing, you know. Mm. But so, but the idea is to see what somebody wants and what somebody can do physically because where I live, it's very, it's very intimidating. It's very hard waiting. So, you know, there are guides that will like force you to do something. You know, I'm not, you're not paying me to like scare you. Or maybe you are. Some people like that. You know, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like really getting inside somebody's head and if they're open to it, helping them, teaching them. I'm really um, I think it's important that a guide teach, you know, and and show people how to do things if they're open to it. You were talking about, you know, people not listening to you and and that happens, too. Mm-hmm. You know, so I so to me, guiding is. I mean, I'm sort of fishing vicariously through them. And yeah, you do have a lot of times where you're like trying not to look at your watch, but looking at your watch, Mm -hmm. you know, then Sims came out with that jacket that had the clear thing over your watch. Yeah. I was like, that's fucking brilliant, dude. Like, cause you, you know, how many times? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) but that doesn't happen very often. And I enjoyed it. I almost felt like like you're a coach, mm-hmm. you know, and that the success is your success or the failure is your failure, you know, and trying to have fun too is important. And also, um, you know, trying to give somebody the space they're looking for, or mm-hmm. like I said, everybody wants something different. You know, I had a guy who's now a very good client of mine, very, uh, successful business dude, whatever. And he just needed to like unplug. And he would, first time I take him out, he brings this like fucking Barca lounger outdoor chair. I'm like, okay, man, whatever. Puts it up, goes out, catches two fish. Then he just goes and just fucking takes a nap, you know? And I'm like, okay, like what what am I doing now? And I'm like, You're doing whatever you want. This guy's doing what he wants. You know, let him have his space, you know, where there are people that just want to fish 24 hours a day. You know, some people like to chill. I mean, I think that's the real art of guiding is to really, like, get what that person is after without really having to – you can ask them what they want. And I do always ask people what they're up for doing. Do you want to fish? Do you want to check this out? Do you know what kind of water do you want to fish? We have very variable water where I live and – um but lot, I, of, I think a lot of times people do, don't even really know what they want. Right. Well, then, you know, sure. then you kind of have... Unless you have somebody who's, who's a really a good angler and right. they've, they've done a lot, of, a lot of fishing. Right. Oh, absolutely. Most of the time. I got a lot of beginners. Um, where I live, the fishing is hard, man. It's not an easy place do to fish. Do you fall in often? You know, I'm pretty... Uh, okay, so I was a um, pretty good athlete, pretty good balance... And I probably went 25, 26 years falling in literally maybe four or five times. Pretty good, right? And then I got cancer in 2017. And I had uh, a chemo. I had a very rare abdominal cancer. And we did a, a, I had to do some very strong chemo. And after that, I got uh, peripheral neuropathy, Mm -hmm. which is nerve damage. And that was a real eye-opener for me. The first time I went fishing after the treatment stopped, I fell 
three consecutive days face plant. Not like, you know, you would think if I just had no balance, no sense of. So I, I literally just went face first into the water three days in a row and I almost quit fishing. I was really upset and mad, but. I just learned how to adapt. I had to like start over, essentially. Walk, waiting with canes or uh, with oh, a stick? W- staff, yeah. And I was waiting with a staff. A lot of people use staffs where I am, actually. Uh, but I was using a staff before that, but I really had to like start wearing a shoe size bigger, whatever. But, you know, I you adapt. I got does, it. Does that sound familiar, Ted? I fall in the water every day. <laughs> I go fishing. Good. Well, that's okay. I suck. I used to be able to dance on those moss Dude, as a skier, rocks. man? Come oh, no, on. Oh, no, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I, I fall in with the water this deep. I'm standing there all of a sudden, boom. I'll see him cross the river, and I'll just sit back and get my phone out and start filming, because I know what's happening. <laughs> and then he posts it. <laughs> he makes me look like oh, an that's idiot. Me. Andy doing something. I'll I'll always, I, I go fishing with wet diapers. Oh, every, like, I, almost. I am a real, if I get wet, oh, there's no bigger baby than me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going home. You know, I'm just an, I'm a, a real baby. So, uh, but the Osable is is renowned tough wading. We call them the grease bowling balls. They're big rocks, slippery, um, nasty. It's not really the current that's going to get you. It's just mm-hmm. the slickness. So years ago, we used to have that ESPN great outdoor game thing in Lake Placid, and they did a fishing thing. And there was a, you probably know, um, do you know Steve Perino? Yeah, sure. Skier, ex-skier, yeah, he commentator. Yeah. yeah. And he was doing the fishing commentating. And I met him because we were doing, we were helping them with locations and things. And I said, Hey, you want to go fishing? He's like, Yeah. So I said, Okay, well, we're going to go, uh, you know, to this really amazing area that I had access to serious pocket water. And, uh, so we're getting out of the car and I had, I use those full staffs, right? That fold up really small right here. Mm-hmm. I said, Hey, yeah, I have a bunch of them. I'm like, you want this? He's like, No, I'm good. And I'm like, Okay, let's let's see, you know, because I'm like I said, I'm an asshole, right? So I'm like, I'm gonna kill this guy, right? <laughs> so I mean, I I like I didn't try and hurt him, but I said, all right, well, you know, why don't you start here and I'll 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 go behind you and whatever. And that dude, man, I mean, he was a lot younger. We were all a lot younger, but that di- a guy waited like, you know, like you. I see the skiers training online. You see them standing on top of the gym ball. Yeah, you sure. Know? He was like that. And I'm like. Holy shit, dude! That, yeah. th- he had some skills, but yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not as fast as I used to be, but I'm pretty, still pretty solid. But the balance thing, the same thing with skiing. I had to like first time I got on skis after that uh, neuropathy thing started. I was like, felt like I had never been on skis before, mm-hmm. and I'm a telemark skier. So, and I used to teach skiing to kids. So I had to like basically teach myself to ski again, you know? How pissed off were you? I was really pissed off, but, um, which I think actually made me continue push harder. to push harder. So let's go back to the C word, you know, the whole cancer yeah. thing. What did you first think when they, and when they, the words came out of that doctor's mouth that you've, that you're sick? You know, I was kind of, uh, well, I had no symptoms. Okay. It wasn't like I wasn't feeling well, you know, or had pain anywhere. It happened uh, to be that I went to my um, general practitioner doctor, who was a very good friend of mine and also an angler, uh, avid angler, and um, for a flu shot. And I got my flu shot, and he just gave me a regular exam, palpate, you know, and he touched my abdomen. He's like, mm, I don't know, man. We've got to get that checked out. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, we'll get an ultrasound. So I had the ultrasound and, you know, it's bad when you go for an ultrasound and the dude is like, I'll be right back, you know? And then he brings another guy into the room oh, no. and they look at it and they're like, yeah, we'll be right back, you know? And then, and then, then they bring another are, guy, you know, and they're like, are... why don't we want you to go over to the hospital right now to like get a CAT scan? I'm like, oh, Was fuck. it a lump that they found? Or... No, it was a, just... um it was a – it turned out to be a, um, a – like a large um, – it wasn't a tumor. It's not a tumor. It was a – like a big cyst, like fucking big, oh, dude, wow. like this big. And they could feel it when they were doing yes. the checkup. And, and you felt nothing before then. Felt, you didn't feel like anything was well, tight I'll tell down you there. What, all right. We're going to – I'll just you tell you exactly. you're pregnant at No. <laughs> I was like fucking 54 years old, dude. So um, – 
I was doing uh, like some uh, crunches and stuff on a gym ball and I, I'll just get, I'll tell you exactly. So <laughs> I would um, like sort of pee a little bit, you know, and I'm like, right, this is what happens to old women, right? This is what's happening to me now. Like not a lot, but just a little would squirt out because of the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Really- but uh, so I was like, whatever. I didn't think anything of it, you know, but meanwhile, this fucking football inside my Well, actually, what happened was I had this growth inside of my peritoneal cavity. Okay. What is that? That's like the space where all your organs are. So this thing grew inside of there. They don't even know how long. It probably could have even started when I was born or whatever. And I was in uh, New York State. So I went over to Vermont, which was sort of the best medical care, which isn't far. Burlington's like two hours. Saw a guy and he's like, yeah, man, um... We think you have kidney cancer. I'm like, okay. And nothing really like, it wasn't like this. I don't know. I was like, okay, now what? He's like, well, we got to do an MRI and um, we have an appointment in like three weeks. And I'm like, wait a minute. You just told me I have cancer. Now you want me to wait three weeks? That doesn't sound right to me. So I immediately, I called my dad in Boston and yeah, he's like, no, 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 that's not good. We had a good friend family friend who was a doctor at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, which is Harvard Medical School. And I sent him all my uh, films and everything. He's like, get your ass home. And it ended up that I got a cancer called um, primary retroperitoneal mucinous cystadenocarcinoma. And uh, very rare. Like I started looking it up. There are like less than 100 cases of it ever. You know, so of course I get that. And so anyways, they had to remove this thing. And I've got a big ass scar like here. And when they were taking it out of my body, it broke open. Oh, no. And inside of it were, uh, were, were, was like a mucin, mucus, okay, liquid. Like that's what the cancer was being carried in. And it went back into my body. Oh, it's called spillage. Yeah. So – when, it's like uh, the balloon popped and all yeah, the liquid. Yeah, and all popped. the shit went back oh. into my body. So after that, they're like, okay, man, we don't really know what to do. <laughs> I mean, because there wasn't like anything to target. You know, they couldn't like radiate anything. Mm-hmm. So they decided on a, a very strong chemo. But again, I did not have um, any serious uh, pain. I mean, chemo f- sucks, right? I did not lose my hair, but... Um, it wasn't pleasant, and I ended up doing all of my treatment in Boston. I just felt like that was the place to be because of the rareness of my cancer. And so I was flying back and forth between uh, my home and Boston and staying with my family in Boston while I was being treated, go home for two weeks and then go back for another chemo. And at the end of it, they're like, you're good, man, And uh, for a while. And then like anybody, after your treatment, you, you go every three months – for a scan or whatever, and then every six months. And I did two years of that, and then they kind of signed me off, you know? Did, and, it, did that change you in any way? I know in the movie, you know, that they did about you, you know, documenting, you know, your life and your relationship with Jeff. Yeah. You know, um, is it possible that you changed more radically, uh, dramatically after the passing of Jeff? Yeah, than, absolutely. Than, than after your Oh, cancer? for sure, because my... I think in the movie I say, uh, and it's true, like after what happened to him, he got cancer like a year later or two years later. I can't remember. But um, and, you know, all of the bad things about cancer. uh, Hopefully you guys have not had family members or friends that have gone through it. All of the horrible things that can happen to people and the pain and the suffering happened to him. Oh God, my brother, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. My brother died last year oh, I'm at sorry. 63. Oh dude. And the cancer took him one cell at a time for three years. When oh. he died, he looked to be 120 years old. Oh, that, oh, Brutal. I'm so sorry. So that was Jeff's. Um, he, he, yeah, it was, it was fast. It was like five months and Jeff, well, at least it was only five months. Yeah, Jeff. But I think, you know, he was a, a tough dude, very, you know, I, I don't know if stereotype dude, but I think that I know that he did not feel well for a very long time, 
you know, and he just, even before it was diagnosed. Oh yeah, but he yeah. was hiding it. He was hiding it, and he was not trying in, to tough it out. Trying to tough it out, or denial, or what whatever. What kind of cancer did he have? He had a uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma, and um, was we had so Jeff was uh, you know, a, a great angler, and like I said, he started fishing when he was very young, and then when I started getting just to backtrack. When I started guiding, he was bartending at the Hungry Trout had a restaurant. And I'm like, dude, you've got to start guiding. You're so good. And I got him into guiding. Cool. Yeah. So he stopped being in the bar and he was a ski patroller at Whiteface. I can relate to all that. Yeah. Bartending, ski patroller. Yeah, man. And then guiding. And he Mm -hmm. was an amazing brook trout fisherman, like flatwater guy. Right. So anyways, um, his and I was like, dude. Look all in fly, and I'm in the fly fishing world and meeting all these great people and all these opportunities to like, hey, come visit. I'm like, let's start traveling. Let's go to all these places. We know all these people. And he didn't really, he felt like he won the lottery living where we lived, you know, which it's a beautiful place. So I finally convinced him to take a trip to Belize. Okay. Very friendly with Lorianne Murphy, very good friend of mine. She lives down there. We're going to go hang out. We're going to DIY fish. He's like, okay, finally, we're going to do it. And we get down there, and he's not doing well at all, like mm. just not feeling well. And But he's toughing it out. And we got home, and the next day, we went to the doctor. He actually had, had an appointment scheduled. We went to the doctor. She's like, yeah, I want to do like a, a lung x-ray. So we went to the ER for a lung x-ray, and they took four liters of fluid out of his lung that day. And the doctor was like, I don't know how you survived like three flights yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. So they didn't know exactly where the primary was, where it started. It probably started Mm -hmm. in his intestinal tract, but it ended up really manifesting in his lung. And that was the beginning of the end. And it was it was fast and it was bad, you know. And after that, I was like, you know, that's just. Uh, you know, I'm sure you, you, you can relate. Like after your brother went, like things changed dramatically, <laughs> you know, in your life and how you look at life uh, for sure. So, But I also see that, that the – I think you made this quote, you know, go chase your hope. Go chase your dreams. Go live. Yeah. Well, that's more, a classic more fully, thing, but, right? But, but I can't imagine you not having lived fully prior his death. Yeah, because you look like such an effervescent person. You're always on fire. Um, Not really, but thank you for saying that. But yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. And then after that, you really started traveling more. Well, I, you know, heavy grief is pretty brutal, right? Um, I was in the Adirondacks, and I was, you know just overwhelmed and didn't really understand what was happening to me. I'd never really been through any serious loss like that. And it was affecting me, obviously, mentally, physically, everything. And in a very small community, I just wanted, I wanted to go someplace where nobody knew me. I would, you know, I would go into places and and people are weird with grief, man. Grief is a tough one, especially in this country. I think people don't really know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. The people that are around you, you know, and everybody, I think people think that they can fix it, you know, and people, people will say the classic things like, well, he's in a better place or, you know, when one door closes, another one opens, you know, all these. Yeah, fuck that. Well, whatever. But people, because people are uncomfortable, right? about talking about it and how do you help people through grief, you know? And really, I learned a lot, man. I mean, but at that time, I didn't really understand what was going on. So I'd have, you could see it, you know, you'd walk into a room and people would like leave, you know, because they didn't want to deal with it. No kidding. Well, I mean, it wasn't out of, it was just. They didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to say. So I was like, dude, I got to get the fuck out of here. You know, I just want to go someplace where nobody knows me. And nobody knows what happened to me, you know. And I had had a, oh, I had one trip, like a hosted trip to Argentina scheduled. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go um, early by myself. I'm going to go hang out by myself there and uh, and do some fishing. 
Are these the people that you're here at the trade show with? Yeah, the set guys. I had a hosted trip set up mm-hmm. with them. But in the town of Hunin, I did some, uh, you know, uh, intel and found like, okay, there's good waiting opportunities there. And I have a friend in Bariloche, a nice kid that actually is a guide there. And I, Jeff and I worked in Alaska. We guided in Alaska for 10 years. We guided float trips. And this kid actually worked with us as like a boat guy, you know, we taught him to fly fish and he's an amazing guy on the Lamai. So I knew I was going to visit him, but I had like two weeks by myself. And that time was awesome for me. I really kind of got my shit together and I was fishing my ass mm-hmm. off on the Majeo River. It was unbelievable. I had this little, I uh, stayed in the most amazing little dive of a hotel. It was the, one of the first fishing lodges ever in Argentina. You walked into uh it's called Osteria Chimuin. It's in Junín de los Andes. The whole thing is full of pictures of like Joe Brooks. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, really? Oh, dude, it was amazing. It was a dive, right? It was 50 bucks a day with breakfast. It was amazing. But I mean, it was a dive place I to I want to be there right now. Oh, it was pretty cool. Um, and then it was maybe 45 minutes to the Majeo. And I had a little rent-a-car and I fished that whole thing. Did you, he- is that when you healed? I think it was very uh, healing for me. Of, uh, it it was, yeah, I think you're always healing, you know, uh, from grief. I don't think grief, I don't know. I think, I don't know if it ever it gets better. You know what? It just I gets found? different, right? You know what you, I found? That, let, hold on one second. You did say that in the film, and I wrote this down. You said it doesn't get any easier when you lose someone with time, it just gets different. Yeah. I think so. What do you think about well, your brother I, with I, that? I, I think that initially, it's right here. Yes. You can't get rid of it. Yes. You see it. You feel it. Yes. You smell it. The death of my mom, my dad. Yes. There's, you know, they're older. Yes. Um, but uh, the, all all death, family members, loved ones. Yes. You cannot get it over here to the side. Right. And eventually, I know that t- they say time heals all things. Yeah. And it definitely does. Yes. It doesn't heal it. Right. But it makes you capable of dealing yes. with it and, yes. and i eventually it eventually for me grief has a, the ability to move right over here right on and you can tap into it whenever you want right but or it'll tap you yeah i mean you have this always this constant you know communication and relationship yeah but what i really hate about about big heartbreak is i cannot fucking get a, around the corner right and and I'm this I when I felt grief in my life I would crawl up in a ball yeah for I I crawled up in a ball and for two years one time yep I hear you man I totally every fucking every night hear at you. five I start drinking Jack Daniels yep. I'm oh, on yeah. Xanax twenty four seven and finally I just one day I woke up personally yeah I woke up sick and tired of being sick and tired right on man and all of a sudden I had a clear a clear path let me ask you this. Did you um, do a lot of fishing at that time? I couldn't do anything. You couldn't do anything. At one time, I was tarpon fishing. Yeah. At 10 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't stop crying. Yeah. I said, I, I was with Eric Hurstead. Uh-huh. I said, Eric, take me home. I, I just yeah. want to go home. And I I do best in a dark corner. Right. Just no people, no right. sound, no sight, nothing. I hear you there. I mean, right after Jeff passed, he passed in October, on October 2nd. And... um. I did a lot of fishing. You know, I, I fish solo a lot. Mm-hmm. I really enjoy fishing solo. I mean, this is trout fishing, you know, wading and stuff. So I don't need a boat. I don't need somebody else to pull me around or whatever. But I did a lot of fishing. In fact, I uh, there's a the funeral home where I had him cremated. Jeff would not, he did not want a big funeral. He didn't want, you know, mm-hmm. he wanted a party, you know, we eventually had it two years later because of COVID, but whatever. But I dropped off his ashes or I picked up his ashes at the funeral home. And then I went landlocked salmon fishing like around the corner. It was in downtown Plattsburgh, you know. And for me, like fishing was like, for me, fishing is always about a place where I can like my brain turns off, you know. You and, just react. And I don't have to think about anything mm-hmm. but fishing for me at least, you know, and and that was very important to me, like at that time or or any time where I'm in serious. I mean, it's sort of like my denial place. You know, all I'm doing is focusing on fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost my mom in December, this past December. And uh, 
you know, she was she was old and she had Alzheimer's and I, we knew and she wasn't there really for a while, you know, and and we knew she, we were going to lose her. And and I didn't think that it would hit me as hard as it did. So like this whole past month, I've been kind of like you and I don't have fishing right now. It's like I've been You're into stuck. that into that dark place. So th- this is actually my first and I live alone and I have a dog, you know, but there are days where I don't even talk to anybody. So that is brutal right and i was almost like God, i wish it was fishing season because then i could at least do something be right. out there like engaging but yeah but you get yeah i i agree with you like it starts to or i almost look at it sometimes like i'm just trying like there's a huge weight on top of me and i can't lift it you know and maybe some days i can move it you know mm-hmm. and there have been days in the last month where man if i like went out and chopped some wood and got the stove going. I mean, that's about all I did all day, you know, and, and you feel horrible about that, but you, it just paralyzes you, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's horrible and everybody goes through it. Everybody, you know, yeah. and, and then, yeah, maybe it does get lighter or whatever, but I don't know. I like to, you know, think that really, and this is true of a lot of things, like the only way through it is through it. Yeah. You know, nothing's going to, Everybody has their own path through uh, through pain. For sure, man. And but I think this time with my mom, like I kind of had like I understood it better Mm -hmm. because of going through what I did with With Jeff. Jeff, I said, okay, I understand what's happening to me, but that didn't make it any easier, Mm -hmm. you know. So, right. So it is, you know. But it's but I think when you lose somebody and and you see, like for instance, Jeff, he was sixty five and he had just retired. And he loved to bird hunt. He was a bird hunting guide as well. And he had plans, you know, he wanted to travel and with the dogs and do this and that and this and that. And he never got to do any of it, you know, it was sad. And so that to me gave me like the, okay, I'm going to fucking do it. You Mm -hmm. know, like I'm not going to wait, you know, and there are a lot of reasons why people do wait, you know, but a lot of reasons are those, a lot of those reasons I think are not good. You know, I mean, just the whole, it's a, it's a, it's a total stereotype, but like life is short, man, you know, like you don't know when something's going to happen or, and so, you know, if you can do it, you know, do it. And Mm -hmm. I've just started to sort of follow through on some of that stuff. And it's kind of a weird feeling, um, and I feel a little guilty about it sometimes because I know if, like, Jeff were alive, I might not be doing a lot of the stuff that I'm doing that I'm really enjoying, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, that's part of a relationship, mm-hmm. you know? I don't know if you're married or anything, am, but, yeah. but, you know, you make, you know, you know, I, you know Rachel, compromises. I, th- I think, and, too, you know, from afar across this table listening, there's almost kind of a freeing thing uh-huh. at some point. Where you have this burden, this black yeah. cloud, this weight, this, you know, it's here, it's yeah. here, it's everywhere. And once once you can get around that corner, you can see life in such a better yeah. um, perspective. Like, wow. And especially when you start looking at age. Yeah. You know, like I'm 71. So yeah. let's just I'm say 61. I take a ruler yeah. and, and I've got 100 inches for 100 years. Yeah. If you can, if you can get to a hundred, I'm 71. So right. now I'm looking, I'm closer to the end than yeah. I am to the middle. Sure. Um, so now I've got maybe so many years that I'm going to be really, uh, capable yeah. uh, of, of still doing a lot of great things. Right. But pretty soon I'm going to fall off that cliff. I've already started that, that downhill slide, but the freeing thing is like, like, like you were just talking about, man, life is short. Let's get after it. Yeah. You know, and all these great things about and dreams about traveling the world and fishing great places. Yeah. I'm starting to think too, a little bit more so like you. Yeah. Like Nikki, let's go do these things. Yeah. Let's go to catch Dorado yeah. in Bolivia. Yeah. Or let's go catch striped marlin in Mags Bay. I'm gonna right. do that because right. if I if you don't do it now, you won't do it. Right. But go catch a Dorado in Argentina too, man. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty for fucking sure. awesome. But that was amazing. And then I also I'm a bit of a um I don't know. I, I believe in karma, you know? And do you believe uh, in God? Do I believe in God? Uh technically no. I believe I believe in fishing, man. Uh <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Like when I'm fishing, I feel like that's my religion, you know. I mean, I grew up Jewish. I mean I was bat mitzvah, the whole spiel, you know, I went to 
Hebrew school, reformed Jew, but whatever. I don't, um, yes, if, if I write on a form, yes, I'm Jewish or whatever, but I'm not like a, uh, a practicing Jew. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, I will, uh, go to a Seder or, you know, if, uh, whatever. Um, you're more spiritual than religious. Yes. And I feel like fishing to me is very spiritual, you know, uh, just the whole act of, of of the whole process of it like even if you're not technically always fishing all the time but the places you go and the things that you see you know or mm-hmm. wherever you are yeah, whether you're sure. in 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 argentina or in you know even even in new jersey you could be on a trout stream and still have you know places where you're gonna start you know thinking about things bigger than you or seeing mm-hmm. things that will sort of Say, well, how did that fucking get here? You know, like, I don't know. You know, I like to look at little details when I'm on the water, like the way the foam, you know, or lichen and things like that and things that are very, you know, details and things like that. Well, you're um, an artist. You're looking at every stroke. Yeah. Or, or it depends, too, like where you are. Like when I was doing a lot of, and that'll always inform my art as well. When I used to spend a lot of time windsurfing, I was always on the water. So I'm seeing like very big you know, horizon, you know, large space and trying to maybe let that inform my work. And then I moved to the mountains and in the woods a lot. And I became very aware that I was like, wow, I'm kind of surrounded a little more. Unless, you know, you climb and go up, you still have, you have both, you know. You mm-hmm. have, and um, I used to do, when I was in graduate school, you know, we were we would read a lot of theory and uh, very complicated books and things like that. And it was very hard for me um, just to, you know, like French deconstruction, de- deconstructive theory and all of this really brainy shit. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck? I, I don't get it. And then finally I stumbled upon this guy. His name is Gaston Bachelard. And it's a pretty famous book in art schools. It's called The Poetics of Space. And he wrote many books. This guy was kind of a cool dude. He was a, a, a poet and a philosopher and a scientist. And he w- so he wrote a whole book about fire, you know, like like what's what it's because we all know when we look at fire, you kind of start dreaming into mm-hmm. it, you know, mm-hmm. and all sure, of the sure. connotations of that. But the book about space was really cool uh, to me, at least. And he wrote about this feeling that he had of intimate immensity. OK, so like. That you could still feel like the bigness of things, even though you were confined. Confined, mm-hmm. and I started like thinking about that, like being in the woods or being in the water. You know, the trout streams where I am are very intimate, and I started really um, loving that and letting that inform uh, my work. I'm a bit of an abstract painter, so using things like that to inform what I was making or whatever. But how many cigars do you smoke a day? <laughs> Way too many, man. Uh, Let's see. I'm trying to figure out if my dad smokes more than you on the oh, water. There's you no smoke. way that he does. <laughs> no way. I got a quick question How for many you. do you smoke a day? Uh, depends on how good the fishing is. Right. Like, like if we're tarpon fishing and it's good, we chain smoke cigars all day we'll long. Do, we'll yeah. do three, four. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, big fat, big fat, you know. What's your favorite Cuban. cigar? Monte Cristo number two. Oh, nice. That's a good one. That's a nice one. So I started off, good story, tons of black flies. In the Adirondacks, brutal. I don't know if you guys have them out west. That's how the I started worst, too. The worst MFs ever. The black flies, bite horrible, your right? Ass. They and, take chunks off your body. Oh yeah, oh yeah. They're just so. Uh, when I started fly fishing, Jeff was a, a cigarette smoker, and he used to roll his own cigarettes. He was also a huge pot smoker. Uh, but up to that point, I had uh, never been a cigarette smoker. Smoked a bunch of pot, whatever. So we're out on the stream. Bugs are fucking brutal. And uh, he's like, oh, you got to have some smoke, you know. So he bought me a pack of Swisher Sweets. Dick Paul Dixon, too. Swisher Sweets. That's well, all he smoked. So I'm like, okay. So I light one up. And I, like I said, up until that point, every only thing I had really smoked was pot, right? So what so do I do? Nailing. I'm like, <laughs> with a Swisher Sweet. <laughs> like, dude, that's like disaster right i immediately threw up all over the place you know and um but like any good addict i really adapted pretty quick and figured it out um my and then i realized 
just like you know when you start drinking as a kid you drink like cheap shit like Boone's Farm and and those premixed like well now there's premixed everything but back then like what was oh do you Lee have Lee from like, Milch Lee from Milch okay we had um like this stuff called Tango which was like a premixed screwdriver it was basically like Tang and cheap vodka <laughs> and that's like the first thing I drank where you got super sick like I'll never have another screwdriver again do you have a drink like that like your first like that you got so fucking sick from. Yeah. Well, no, remember? Unfortunately, I still continue to go down that ugly road <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> Jack Daniels okay. is, you know, I go, he and I go way back. You were telling me a story about the first time you smoked a cigarette as a kid and your dad caught you. Oh, yeah. My dad caught me smoking cigarettes. He made me smoke the whole fucking pack. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, that was, oh. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah. That's brilliant. No, no, but get this. So my dad was a real redneck German German man, right? Uh huh. And he worked his ass off. He didn't have running water. What did he or, do? He was in the lumber business, but as a young man, he didn't have running water or a toilet in the house until he was eighteen years old. In so Germany it, or no, in the no, states? No, it's in the states. They were all farmers. Mm -hmm. and, um, Where? In uh, in Wyoming. Uh huh. You know, I was I was I was born in uh, Laramie, Wyoming. Uh huh. And, and he always told me, and he was kind of a real redneck, strict uh -huh. man. And then we moved to Aspen, and uh, I was seven years old when we got to Aspen, and eventually I started, you know, getting around. I mean, Aspen was on fire back in the early '70s right. and through the '80s. And sure. At some point, all my buddies were smoking pot, but I was a skier, yeah. so I was yeah. never doing that right. stuff. But I broke my leg. Uh huh. When I was about sixteen, so now I'm bored. I'm not, I've got nothing to do. My buddies say, hey, "Let's go smoke some pot." Right. Yeah. So I come home fucking stone man and i'm like paranoid uh -huh. so scared my dad always told me if i catch you smoking oh pot, no i'm calling the cops so here i am a little 16 year old kid <laughs> my eyes are bloodshot it looked like it looked like oh my i had fire in my eyeballs and that's what that was the first sign you know uh, my dad starts saying, okay, you just tell me what you've been doing and everything's gonna be good i, I just want to hear the story you know he kind of yeah, yeah. set me up I yeah said, well joey and i smoke some pot God damn it! Are you fucking kidding me? Smoking pot? He called the cops. No, no. Did they come? Oh yeah! Oh, I love it. Sheriff Whitmire came to the front door. He's got six shooters on his hips, and you're and shitting said, in your pants. I'm right? shitting in my pants. Sixteen year old stoned ass fucking young little kid. Oh, and he scared the shit out of oh, you. Oh no doubt. I can never smoke pot again. And your dad probably <laughs> talked to him on the phone. Like, every just, time just I just come smoke over pot. and scare the shit out of him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, every I love time it. I smoke pot after that, I could see Sheriff Whitmire coming. <laughs> oh coming yeah, that's good, that's good, man. Yeah, man. That's good. So yeah, so I fucking <laughs> I hurled on the water, but again, I adapted quickly and um you know, I uh we started uh guiding in Alaska and that's pretty buggy place and I was smoking back then uh I like punch Rothschild double Maduros I like a du a, a, a dark cigar mm. but I started you know I mean easily five four five six a day no problem yeah. no problem those um, are some good numbers. Those it, are high. Oh, well, it's nothing well, to be Swisher proud of. Well, the Swisher Sweet's not real big and fat. Well, no, and Swisher long. Sweet. These were the the punch Rothschilds, and uh, started getting expensive. Oh, so they're, dude. they're bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are the real and ones. Um, so now I'm just a a, a backwoods, uh, you know, uh, addict, and um, I should be on an ambassador for them on their pro staff. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's nothing to be proud of. It's a bad habit. Um, in the beginning, you know, I don't know. It's just like anything, you know, you, you, you kind of, uh, I'm pretty, I have an addictive personality. So let's just say I'm a pretty good addict, which is nothing to be proud of again. So mm -hmm. I do. Was there any worries after having cancer that you were smoking these things? Um, For a little while, yeah. I mean, again, that's, it's not a good practice. Uh, I, you know, it's kind of happened, I think, right after I got sick. I was very conscious of my health. Mm -hmm. And then, for me at least, I kind of went through, and I'm still in it, maybe coming out of it, into more of a de denial of my health. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I don't want to know what's wrong with me. You know, I feel fine, you know, yeah. but, like, more preventative things, like skipping that mammogram and skipping that, 
you know, check up, you know. It's Don't like, skip those things. I know. But that I can tell you that, um, you know, I kind of went through a period like that. Yeah, I shouldn't be smoking as a cancer survivor for sure. But again, uh, I don't know. I need uh, – got to have some vice, I, I, right? I think yeah. that too it's almost like, you know, this is part of your freedom after the cancer and the losing de- uh, Jeff. Yeah. You just want to be free and go fishing. It, I know, but it's fuck, it's fuck bad. It. It's yeah. it's really bad. Yeah, and no... I – you know, I had uh, a real um, – you know, my dad's like a type 2 diabetic. I was like right on the cusp of that and heavy – and I went on a, you know, I lost 50 pounds and I was like, oh, you know, and um, doing all right for a little while. Then I'm sort of now on the back. I haven't gained 50 pounds back, but I definitely gained a little bit of that weight back and need to, as as you know, at our age, you mm-hmm. know, it's not easy to no. keep it going, man. So mm-hmm. I, I, you know, yes, I do need to stop smoking. Um, I I need to work on it. Some of these guys are into those, uh, the Zin. Mm-hmm. Do you do that? Mm-mm. Do you know that it's like a chew, but it's a, it's I a have, pack of that. I yeah, have yeah. done it, but yeah. yeah. I might yeah. need to start doing that. You know what? I, I want to go back to, to the fishing. And yeah, going to let's the river. talk fishing. Um, do you find certain days you go to the river and your mood and your energy is not matching your surrounding you know, water, river, and the hatches, and you're like... You have maybe a lot of too much energy. I'm going to force this. Yes, and it doesn't work. Yes, and and other days you go to the river and you sit back, and you're a little bit more mellow and calm. Yes, and you start feeling, you know the you know the birds and the and the match or yep. the hatch and the and the flies in the river, and all of a sudden you get dialed before you ever even put a fly on, tie a fly on. Oh and, yeah, and those days are just like. You, you jam magic and yeah. other days the river's not available to receive you yep. in any way for sure tell me about the the balance and imbalance okay of, of you as a guide or maybe just you as a fisherman well in the, it would in the be river different too. well i'm very intuitive okay and that i think comes from my artistic side and i'm always at my best when i trust myself most people are right but as far as being an angler and a guide, I've had more success on the days where I accept like what I'm, you know, like, and it'll just happen. Like you're driving to a spot and then all of a sudden I'll be like, no, go to this spot. And I'll be like, and then your, your, your brain, your right brain will be like, no, don't go to that spot. It's too far and whatever. But just fucking listening accepting like you're not you're like I hear voices or anything like that relying on your instincts and your instinct on your intuition I've had more success doing that or making choices about what we're going to do here you know with with uh, with a client for say like okay yeah let's um like instead of uh you know fishing a streamer let's try a really big dry and maybe give it some action you know Mm -hmm. like a little surface activity where I live that's really key when you're fishing dries we fish a lot of dry flies in pocket water, we're not seeing a lot of rising fish, but you can make them rise. So you're right? bouncing them, yeah, or we're you're skittering, skittering them. them. Yeah, huge. Yeah. you know. But whatever, just but but whatever that choice is. But by being intuitive, I've had more success. Whatever that means, you know, as far as having a really good day, whether it's myself or with a client, by by sort of following that voice or whatever. But as far as yeah, the attitude of fishing. I might have it in my – if I'm fishing by myself, I say, okay, I'm going to go from point A to point – not B, C, up all the way to F. I'm going to wade this whole thing and then I'll walk back to my car and it's – you know, and just walk up the middle of the river the whole way and fish it, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some days you're like, oh, dude, this is amazing. I'm crushing it, you know, catching fish and just feeling really solid. And then other days you're like, oh, I don't have it in me today, man. I don't have – so I'm going to like go back maybe and – and and but that doesn't mean you're out of the game, you know. Maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna slow down a little bit, you know. And I'm really I really love to swing flies. Absolutely love uh, two handed casting. I'm not very good at it, but I really enjoy it. And I've had some amazing clients over the years, older guys that have taught me so much about swinging wets. Do you guys ever swing wets for trout or? I mean, I nymph fish with yeah. with the bottom wet fly, and then I'll you know swing it at the end. And You're a lot a of dirty times, dirty ass nympher. Yeah. Okay. 
I am too. But, uh, <laughs> no, I'm talking like traditional. No, no. Dragging jewelry down the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> traditional, like, you know, one or two or even what they call a brace of flies, two or three. No, that was never the, done that. But I had, I had some amazing, the old guys are the fucking best, right? I had a guy who was a doctor. I mean, when I got him, he was probably in his 80s. And, you know, he, he didn't need a guide. He needed somebody to help him. You know, he would, you know, could barely tie a fly on. I would tie a fly on and I'd show it to him. He'd go, oh, you know, he was so stoked. And he would just, you know, uh, and then he would stop and, or he would let out all this. Like, I'm like, what is this guy doing? I'm just going to watch. Shut up, Rachel. Shut up. Don't get, cause I'm a bit of a, I can be a little bossy sometimes. So it's hard to tell but uh whatever (laughs) and just learn and this guy would just like lift his rod i had another guy like that that would actually light his pipe during that time right he would throw a streamer out man 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 slack 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 take his pipe out and he would fucking pick pick it up and there'd be a fish on it almost every fucking time but uh swinging wets is just sort of i don't know i love the idea of it's so subtle and you have to sort of re- imagine being that fly, like a good nympher would. I mean, are you a um, indicator guy or dry dropper or euro? Dry dropper indicator. I don't. I don't euro fish. Okay. But a lot of times when that you know in the dead heat of summer, the euro is is the is how to get them. Dude, it's yeah, it's how to get them. So it's pretty amazing. I'm gonna start doing I mean, that. This this I, it's just it. What's know, it's, what's worse? What's worse that why why is that worse than like watching an indicator? I think it's actually more fun with Euro. I mean, I, there are problems with Euro. There's no question in my mind. You know why? I like watching the indicator move. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, I get that. I mean, but I think like tight line or whatever. I like to call Euro nymphing contact nymphing. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of times I can't get right up to the hole. Right. So I'm fishing a hole that's. That's twelve feet across. Okay, well there, yeah, there and is a time euro, and a place yeah. for the for the indicator. It's a little tough sure. with the euro there, but for pocket water fishing in relatively shallow water, I'd say four feet and lower. Yep, there is nothing more effective than contact or tight line. Fishing sure, because you have so much control over that fly. Right, but the whole idea too is you have to like know where that fly is. But you have so when you're when when I explain this to people and I say okay we're gonna fish when you fish an indicator like do you know where your fly is kind of kind of but kind of no. sort of you never when you tight line fish you know exactly where your right. fly is dude and when you're like for instance on my river you'll have like you'll see a pocket like maybe with a little plunge you know there's a fucking fish there right but to actually get a fly to that depth that quickly with an indicator is tough yeah sure right so sure. the tight line or the whatever you want to call it is very effective. I think that um, for me, I'm more engaged. It's very visual. But, you know, watching an indicator is, is also visual. I think that the danger of, uh, of that type of Euro style is that people are just catching a lot of fucking fish and yeah. they're putting a lot of dam- – they're damaging a lot. Right. I mean, there's a lot. It's amazing how many more fish you're going to catch that way is that – Always the goal, maybe not, you know, and I think that it's detrimental to the fish for sure. As we get closer to the end of this podcast, if someone wants to fish with you, Rachel, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Okay. Um, I work at a place called The Hungry Trout. It's in Wilmington, New York. Uh, you can look it up online, uh, hungrytrout.com, uh, hungrytroutflyshop.com, I think it is. And then I do some trips to uh, Argentina with the guys from Set Fly Fishing. But you can reach me through the Hungry Trout for that as well. Um, awesome. And then what, what rivers do you fish? I fish the West Branch of the Os Sable uh, and then also the Saranac River system. These are all in northern New York. And then I fish all the way up to the Canadian border. There's some excellent fishing up in the watershed that flows into the St. Lawrence River. The watershed that I'm in flows into Lake Champlain, uh, the Salmon River. It's not the Salmon River with the steelhead in it that people know in New York and the Chattagay River and a bunch of ponds and stuff like that. We do some smallmouth fishing as well, Very which cool. is also just becoming a reality because of climate. We're, mm. we're in the crosshairs of climate uh, 
problems where I live. We were having real problems with water temps and having uh, water way too warm to be fishing in. Is this like a eight, nine month fishery or? It's May to October. Okay. You know. Um, Best time, your favorite time to fish? Anytime you can. Uh, if someone wanted to no. fish with oh, you, all right, okay. Uh, I'd say uh, I like the fall, September. Um, you know, I I used to would I would say like June, but now June is almost too warm. I'd sure. say May. May is good. Cool. Um, yeah, man. Um, yeah. Anything else that you would like to add to this? Great conversation. Well, I wish we could have talked more about fishing, but uh, but I think we, we, we had a good conversation. I would just say, you know, like we have so much knowledge right now, you know, and there's so much available knowledge to us. And I think people need to slow down a little bit, you know, and, and not worry so much about how many fish they're catching or how big they are and really enjoy like the – I have a very good friend who's a, a very good guide. His name is Jason Dapra. He guides on the Delaware. He's also a great saltwater guy. He does the fall run on Montauk, and he guides for some really big stripers in Jersey. And he has – I stole this completely from him. He'll, he'll say it's all about the hang. You know, fishing is all about the hang, which I wholeheartedly agree with. It's all about mm-hmm. – you know, friends being and... with your buddies or whatever. It's all about the trip there where you like tripped over the whatever pavement and broke your shoulder or whatever. It's not about that. But I mean, it's about the process. Sure. Mm-hmm. And that's what art is about, too, for me. It's about the process. It is about the end result for sure. And I just think that for me, at least, getting involved with fishing, which was the last thing I ever thought I would be involved with, has been one of the best gifts of all, you know, and, and it's all about the people that I've met. You know, and the, mm-hmm. and the great community that we have. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Amen. Yeah. I totally agree. And that's what Popovich was preaching, you know, a couple of days ago during his podcast. He said, man, it's not about the fish. It's all my buddies. Look at them. They're all, all the photographs of all of his right. friends are in his room. Right. These are my pals. Right. This that being family. said, though, I think we also, especially now, that we uh, have a responsibility to, like, take care of the resource yeah Mm -hmm. especially now with so you know a lot of shit happening in the world and uh we need to make time for you to be you know uh more of an activist and to get involved with conservation Mm -hmm. or whatever kind of resource you're working with whether it's ocean rivers etc etc so that I haven't been the best at through my time. I think I've been a little selfish and share that and share some of my time towards that kind of uh, Well, you stuff. have time left, you know. Oh, I dude, mean, yeah, man. There's a, there's, a, there's a certain point where all of a sudden, you know, the, for me, it's like um, it's okay to be fishing less, but raising money more. Yeah. Traveling more to raise money. Yep. Uh, not necessarily making money for me, but making right. money, raising money for BTT, for Captains for Clean Water, Absolutely. IGFA, all those organizations. And, you know, I've always thought in in the old adage, you know, think globally, but act locally. Right. Take care of your house. Exactly. And that's a start. And if everybody took care of their local waters. Right. That's a, that will really solve a lot of problems. Right. And that, and that can be a little intimidating, too, to, you know, where do I start? You know, how do I help? You know, mm-hmm. I don't have a lot of money. You know, what what can I do? Yeah, you have time. Go help even, raise money. And make small changes in your own life, you know? Sure. like You know, one of the things I do, Rachel, I don't like catching fish anymore in my home water. Okay. I really don't. Okay. I go down during a hatch and like a caddis hatch, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there and watch the bite. I don't set the hook. Uh-huh. I don't need another trot in my hand. And I'll just spend the evening smoking a cigar. Yeah. And boom. There's one. Boom. Yeah. And when I float a river, I feel badly that when I hook a fish, it takes 200 yards to release him because you're floating. Yeah. And now the fish are going, wow, man, where's my house? Yeah. You know, (laughs) what happened to me? So that's the way I'm starting to think. And when I get on the boat with uh, Jay Scott, we'll float from Aspen to Basalt. And I said, Jay, I really don't want to catch a fish today. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, this is hang. Yeah. Get like 100 bites and catch maybe two accidentally. Dude, you should just cut the hook off. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay because if you don't do anything, there's a good chance you're not going to catch them anyway. I had um, 
so Joan Wolf, uh, years ago, uh, you know, she's amazing, right? So many, many years ago, she came up to the Adirondacks. They were making a film about Lee, uh, and, and they were using some of our private water from the hungry trout. So I, I took them out. I wasn't guiding them. And she showed me a great trick, like, cause I'll do this for guiding. I'll go out and scout, but you don't want to catch those fish. Mm-hmm. She's like, cut the hook off of a fly and just, you at the, know, at the bend. Yeah. And also like if you're demoing first for a client, right. what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Yeah, you're going to catch one. You're going to catch one. And where I am, that could be like the only fish of the day. dude. <laughs> oh, that's not God. a good thing. So I started doing that. And, uh, yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. And there are people that will fish that way. I mean, she, uh, she's amazing. And, uh, quick story though, when we were out on the water with them, again, I wasn't guiding. And she, uh, looks over to me and she says, Hey, can you tie a tippet on for me? And I don't even know if I had my guide's license yet. So I'm like, Okay. How you old know? is she at the time? Oh, she was probably. In her sixties, like she, she's still. I mean, I've I've been lucky enough to spend some time with her in the last couple of years. She's still doing pretty good, man. I think she's ninety five or ninety six. She's amazing, but she was probably in her early sixties. Asked me to tie a tippet on, and again, I I didn't know anything, so I. It's like polishing stew apps is real. So I You're asked her. her I said, on. "Well, how much?" Right. So. I mean, I'm taller than her, and I don't even think she was wearing glasses, but she basically was like, you don't fucking know, you know? I mean, she didn't say that, you know? <laughs> but she, like, looks at me, like, and she's like, tells me how much. I'm like, okay. So I cut it off, and then I start tying um, uh, a surgeon's knot, double surgeon's knot. And she looks at me, and she says, oh, you use the easy knot. You know, like you're not tying a blood knot, right? And I just about shit in my pants, you know? <laughs> and from that day on, I still will tie. But she, she's a hard ass. But what an amazing, she's a hero of mine for sure, man. You should interview her. You know, uh, I'd been talking to her. We were supposed to interview her on um, Wednesday of this week. Uh-huh. So about a month ago, I called her, you know, and we had a great conversation. And she said, oh, you know, I don't remember much. I said, well, neither do I. Yeah. We'll have a great time. So I got her all chummed up, and she was going to do it, and then she canceled like uh-huh. last week just before we got oh, here. Oh, that's too bad. It's such a bummer because she's been such a great inspiration to, for so many people. Oh, men and women. She's yeah, just amazing. Absolutely. She's a badass, let me tell you. I mean, just incredible. Uh, and to think about what she had to go through, you know, is really pretty amazing. And um, yeah, she's I, one I of the unicorns. Her, I bought her DVD and both her books. I'm, I watched everything. I read the book, and I've, I've got all these notes. I got you know six pages of notes on Joan. I'm all keyed up ready yep. for this interview. And then she, then she says, "Yeah, I didn't." I oh, I get I it, man. You know, I say, Joan, it's all good, man. She, I want she's, you to be but happy. But she's amazing, and, and I just, I, I just hope that like a lot of the young people coming into fishing, men and women will know who she is. And Mm -hmm. I mean, she's got her place in history for sure. Um, But, you know, that we celebrate her as much as we can, you know, because she's just amazing. Yeah, no doubt. We got to wrap this up. But Rachel, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you guys, man. I could chat it up with you for a while, but let's get, let's go do some work. That's all. You got a great life in that film, that Fly Lords and Costa and the American Museum of Fly Fishing did. If you haven't seen it, it's called After You're gone after you've gone after yeah. you've gone it's yeah. incredible yeah so the fly lords they i had nothing to do with it man they're a really talented group of young guys and i'm very proud of them that they were made a movie about fishing but also about life and mm-hmm. for guys that young you know they're all in their late 20s you know to carry that off pretty well uh, they did a great job so well, Rachel, you're a real inspiration and a hero to a lot of people. I don't know people. about that. But... No, let me tell you something. You are. Okay. I, I saw your movie and I called you. I said, dude, you're the fucking bomb. I love you. <laughs> I love you. And and I think a lot of our people, or our audience, are going to you know love you just well, as, as much. Well, I hope so. I mean, it's all. I'm just one, one of many. There's so many of us out there. And uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Rachel. All right, man. Thank you so much. What a source, but that story. What a source, just a